Okay, well, we are continuing our series on finding purpose. Now, the last time we were together, we talked about the purpose of our faith, the purpose of our faith, and that's really a, a, a big deal. We, uh, why is it that we have, why is it we're supposed to have faith? What is the purpose? Well, I covered a few different things. First of all, faith is our hope. Faith is also our help. And faith, of course, gets us to heaven. Faith gets us to heaven. And I, I thank God that that's what faith does. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saves us. Now that is wonderful. Faith gets us to heaven. Faith gets us there. It's not our works. It's, uh, and I thank God for that. Because if it was all about our works getting us to heaven, uh, I wouldn't be going. Because my works are insufficient in the sight of God. And they're always lacking. Well, this morning we're talking about the topic of the purpose of suffering. Uh, the purpose of suffering. Now, by way of introdu- introduction, I want to give you four quick things that, that uh, I, I, it feels hard to preach a message like this. In the midst of people who suffer, and, uh, and, and we are in a society that has a lot of tragedy, and I think everybody here would, can say that, uh, that they've experienced some sort of pain or tragedy at some level at some time in their life. And uh, if, we, if we haven't, then we know somebody maybe intimately that has gone through something. Very, very difficult time. So there are uh, four reasons why I think it's difficult to preach this message. Let me start out by saying this, that I don't completely understand it. I don't completely understand it. I would be a fool to stand up here in front of you and say, I've got this thing all figured out. Some people claim that they have it all figured out. Some people think that they have all the answers when it comes to pain and tragedy. And, and I just have to tell you, as, 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 just a, as just a mere man, I don't completely get it. I've got a, I've got a general idea. And, I, and I'm hoping that I can share that in a way that uh, is helpful to you. Secondly, secondly, I don't want to be offering you a consolation prize. Kind of the runner-up, like, hey, this is the best we have. Now, we've got some good things here. We have the Bible, and we, we, can, we, 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 uh, we search the Scripture, and we find what God has to say about troubles and tragedy and suffering, but, but I don't want it to sound like this is just all we have, because we have the Word of God. And that's an exciting thing. Thirdly, thirdly, I don't think I'll ever be able to completely empathize with, with all of the pain and all of the suffering. There's a lot of tragedy out there, a ton of tragedy. Tragedies that, that you and I, dear God, will never, ever, ever, ever have to experience because they are so bad. But I can't empathize with that. The best thing I can tell you is that I, I don't know. Sounds hopeless a little bit, doesn't it? I remember in, in Bible college, our chancellor, Dr. James Scudder, he would say, he would say that one of the worst things you can do is, uh, for someone going through tragedy is tell, them, is tell them that you know what they're going through. How many times have we tried to, in, in a sense of comfort, try, try to tell somebody that, that um, I know what you're going through? And we, and we at times think that that's helpful, but you know what, friends, I'm just telling you right now that that's not always that helpful. Because quite frankly, you and I may never, ever, ever, ever experience what someone else is experiencing. And on top of that, on top of that, you don't know exactly what they're experiencing. So sometimes the best thing to say is, I don't know what you're going through. Sometimes you just got to look someone in the eye and say, brother, I love you and I don't completely understand. I don't want this to sound like, I, like I'm, I'm detached or that I, I just don't understand because I don't understand, but I don't want it to sound like I don't understand. If that makes any sense, suffering is a hard thing. Suffering can be very, very, very uh, long. It, 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 it's not always. Now, the Bible says our light afflictions, which are but for a moment, worketh a far more exceeding and eternal weight and glory. That's what the Bible says in their light afflictions in the sense of, in the, sense of the scope of eternity. And, and yes, that is true, but let me tell you, for some of us, it's heavy. 
I have to be really careful with that. And lastly, I just have to say this, I never want to be tested. I never want to be tested like some people are tested. Now, I'm, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in pretty good health. My, my wife is in, in, uh, in pretty good health. My kids are in pretty good health. I mean, we're not, we're, not, we're not on the street. We're not, you know, nobody close to us has, 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 has had some, we haven't had a huge loss in our life, and I thank God for that. I don't want this message to be God saying, well, test my servant Joe. I don't want that. And I don't want anybody to go through that. So there is, I'm preaching this with some reservation, but I think that we can find a purpose in our suffering. So uh, let me just begin with our suffering helps us. This is where it begins. I, I sound insensitive already. Because your suffering is going to help you. There are times in our life that our pain and our suffering is chastening. It's just true. It's just true. There are times in our lives when, our, when our, the things we go through, the, the trials in our lives, are things that we've caused. It's the byproduct. It's, it's our fault. And what God is trying to do is He's trying to get us to a right relationship. Now listen, I absolutely love my boys. I love my boys uh, almost more than, more than any. I lo- the only thing I love more than my boys is my wife. And that's true. The Bible says to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. It doesn't say love your children that way. The children are, 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 are runner-up, though. I mean, they're next, okay? So you understand, I love my kids. And anybody of you y'all who see me when, I, when, I, when I'm with my kids, I just love them. But you know what? Sometimes they have to be chastened, don't they? Sometimes, uh, sometimes you've got to do what's necessary to get them to have a right relationship with God. Now, I've, I don't hurt my kids. It doesn't mean that there's not pain on their bottom because there's pain on their bottom. But I do that in order to get them to where they need to be in their relationship with God and, and, and with me. Sometimes pain and suffering will help us. It will get us to where we need to be. Listen to what the Bible has to say in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Don't despise the chastening of God. When God is causing some pain in your life, when God is causing some suffering in your life, now I just got to just let me punctuate this with not all pain and suffering is chastening. I want to be very clear on that, and I'm going to get to that in the next point. Not all pain and suffering is chastening, but when God is doing that, when God is correcting us and there's chastening in our lives, don't despise it. He's doing it for our benefit. It says in verse 12, for whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. The reason he's correcting us is because he loves us. God is not trying to correct us because he hates us. I don't try to correct my children because I hate them. On the contrary, the only reason I'm doing it is because I love them. And I'm trying to get them to have a right relationship. That's the only reason. It's not because I'm angry with them. It's not because I'm mean-spirited and heavy-handed. It's because I love my kids and I want them to have a right relationship with God. So you know what? I chasten them. And here in Proverbs it says, despise not the chastening of the Lord. Just like I chasten my kids to correct them, what Solomon is saying here is when God corrects you, don't despise that. Don't hate it when God is trying to correct us to get us to live right. In Hebrews 12, 5-7, Five to seven, and he hath forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son, almost a verbatim. Listen to this, my son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. So if you're going through some chastening because of your sin in your life, he's dealing with you as sons. That's verification that you are a child of God. 
He loves us and wants to get us right. So when we have sinned, when we're not doing what we ought to be doing, God says, I'm going to bring my chastening hand on you. Don't despise it. Don't, re don't reject it. Don't be weary at it. But he's doing it because he loves you, and he's doing it because you are his son. Verification. People who say, well, I, I, don't, even, I don't even know if I'm saved, but I know God's chastening me. Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, pretty much, I mean, if, that, if you're sure that's God's chastening on you, then, then you're, man, God is telling you, he's, you're a son. Don't despise God's chastening. Don't despise all God's chastening, but don't think that all chastening, all, all suffering is God's chastening. So many of us, we, we always parallel these two. We say, well, well, because, um, because I'm going through something, this has to be, what, what, you know, and they start to in, in, internal, they examine themselves, and they start to say, well, maybe I'm doing something wrong in my life. Maybe, maybe I've done something wrong that, that, is, that, that is contrary to God, and, 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 and maybe that's true. But maybe it's not. These times of chastening are for us to produce righteousness in our lives. That's what the purpose of this. It's to produce righteousness in, his, in our lives. Now, pain and suffering is not fun. Now, we all know that. Again, I don't want to sound insensitive. This isn't, the, this isn't a consolation prize. But let me tell you, pain and suffering is not fun. But listen to this. It's afterward afterward if you allow the chastening to train you to be righteous it yields fruit that's what the bible says listen to this hebrews 12 11. now no chastening for the for the present seemeth to be joyous nobody enjoys being chastened okay listen to this but grievous it's not enjoyable it's not enjoyable Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So what God is trying to do, he's trying to yield fruit in your life, trying to bring forth righteousness in your life, and it's not during the trial, during the suffering, during the pain that you're going to see the fruit. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. This is what one guy has to say about it. He says, we are not to look for proper fruits of affliction while we are suffering. But afterwards, it's the end result. It's look backwards and say, hey, what can I learn from this? If this is God's chastening hand, then we need to be trained by it. That's what it's saying. We need to be trained by it. Now let me give you just a quick point of application under this first point. There are people there are pastors I've heard of in the past who equate everything with punishment. Okay? I remember, I remember hearing shortly after uh, the World Trade Center tragedy that this is God's judgment on, on mankind for their sin. Can you honestly say that? Because I honestly can't. I honestly can't say that. And it's people like that who just say every sort of pain, every, you got a toothache, that's God. He's chastening you in your life. You're suffering. You lose someone, you're doing something wrong. You got sin in your life, brother. Something's wrong. You're going through something and, and it's your fault. And people are so easy and so quick to, to jump to conclusions. So here's the application. You ready? Be gracious with people. Be gracious with people. Sometimes suffering is to help us. Be gracious with them. May, may, maybe it is a result of their sin. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. Maybe it's not a result of their sin. And we're going to look at that in our third point. That it's not always a result of sin. Okay, so point one, uh, our suffering helps us. Point two, our suffering helps others. The suffering that you're going through may really have nothing significantly to do with, with you. That's tough. But it may have everything to do with someone else. And again, I, I risk looking disconnected, but, but this is important. There are times that we, that we go through things for the sake of others. There are times that we suffer, that we suffer that things that happen to us where there's pain is really for the sake of other people. 
uh, 2 Corinthians deals with this wonderful passage. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. I love how he begins this because he talks about being the God of all comfort. It's wonderful. Who comforteth us in all our tribulations. So we're going through tribulation. God comforts us that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Maybe it is a sin in your life and maybe God is comforting you in that sin, that chastening, to bring about some righteousness or maybe that's not the case at all maybe the reason we go through things certain things in our lives at times is that God may comfort us and then we may be able to comfort others the same way that he comforted us for as the sufferings in verse 5 for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ sometimes the purpose of suffering is that we can share with others that are suffering our experience. Sometimes that's what it's all about. Can you imagine that God would allow us or put us through some things that we can share ex our experience with other people? Uh, Harry Truman, he said this, he said, the reward of suffering is experience. As you go through that, as you struggle, as you suffer, as there's pain in your life, regardless if it's your fault or not, as they're suffering, sometimes the reward is experience. Now we can share with others what it is we've gone through. How marvelous. And this is not some consolation prize. This is good stuff. We can help others because we were helped of God. We've got the God of all comfort. How cool is that to have the God of all comfort? And we have the God of all hope. We've got a marvelous God. The God of all hope. Listen to this. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. You know what that means? That means God Almighty gives us what we need through the Holy Spirit that we can right here, that we can abound in hope. We can have tremendous hope in our lives. Sometimes the tragedy is to help other people. I mentioned to you a few weeks ago, a friend of mine lost his son, uh, Ian Ralph. And um, a good friend of mine. And I say a good friend, I mean a good friend. This is, this is a friend. Now, it's, it's interesting. We have one of these relationships that, that though we don't maybe talk every week, uh, we can pick up after not talking for six months and it's just like we left off. How many of y'all got relationships like that? Y'all got friends like that? It's just, there, there, there's just no, there's no problem. If I don't talk to you for six months, now I would like to talk to him more than that. You know, as good of a friend as he is, and we've done a lot of things, I, I actually worked for him. He managed some stores, and, and I, I worked for him at times. We, we've done a lot of things together. But you know what? I've never had a picture with, with Dave. Now, he's a good friend, and I've never, I've never put my arm around this guy, Pastor Dave, never put my arm around him and said, man, let's take a picture. You know how sad that is to, 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 to not have a picture with one of your best friends? So you know what I did? I took a picture. Here's, here's Brother Dave. You all can see that. He's the good-looking guy on the right. The good-looking guy on the left is disguised. See, he's got a beard. That's why he's good-looking. He's got a beard. Amen. See, I like him. He's got a beard. Bill, do I hear an amen? Yeah, there we go. Behind him, behind Dave, Pastor Dave, is, uh, is his church. Now, behind my left shoulder is the cemetery where his son's buried. He walks out his back door into a cemetery where his son is buried. You, you, that smile, what you see on his face right there, that's not a fake smile. That's, that's not a fallacious, uh, you know, I'm trying to smile... It's a facial smile. There's a difference, apparently. My wife tells me, she says, smile with your face. I'm like, I'm trying, I can't do it. That's a, that is a facial smile there. Ten minutes earlier, we put his son in the ground. I can't even imagine the tragedy. I don't even get it. I can't, 
I can't do anything to, 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 I can't muster up enough empathy. I can't get it. I don't know. I don't know. My two kids are here. They're healthy. They're good looking. They take after me. <laughs> right? Yeah. See, they're well trained. I put his son in the ground. Ten minutes later, I say, I put my arm around him. I'm like, brother, I said, I don't have a picture of you, and I hate to make it a day like this. And there were several pictures leading up to this, and he was smiling, and, and his tie was blowing in the wind and all this, and we were standing out there, and he says, come on in for food. And I just shake my head, and I'm like, brother, you have the God of all hope, don't you? He has got the God of, he's got the God of all hope, and it's filling him with all joy and peace and believing. It's amazing. That smile is a real Hundred dollars smile. That's a million dollar smile. We were laughing like you wouldn't believe. And here it is. I'm the one that's trying to be like, okay, well, I mean, your son just died. You know, shouldn't we be? And he's smiling. Brother, come on in for food. Are you going to stay a while? He says, one of these days, I'm going to make it up to your place. I'm going to ride my motorcycle up there. I mean, we're just talking and talking. Tremendous tragedy. But he is able to smile. Someday he will be able to help someone else who has been in the same situation he has been in. Do I think God took Ian home because of Dave's sin? No, I do not. But you know what? Let me tell you, he's going to use this experience and possibly share it with someone else who's going through the same thing. You see, because God is his greatest when we are at our weakest. God's strength always appears when our strength disappears. Isn't that amazing to see that? That God is, God is mighty, but when we're standing up saying, I can handle it. I've got this in the midst of my suffering. Where is God in this picture? God's always the strongest when we're the weakest. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 12. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You know what this is saying? He, let me just dissect part of this for you. My strength is made perfect. That word perfect means complete. So my strength, God's strength is made total. It's made complete when ours is incomplete. When we don't have the strength that we need, God comes in and he says, well, I'm going to give you perfect strength. That's why he says, my grace is sufficient for thee. God's strength is made complete when ours is incomplete. And oftentimes, rather than God delivering us from the problem, he gives us power to deal with the problem. It's not always a deliverance. Sometimes he says, I'm going to help you get through this that someday you can be a blessing to someone else who is suffering and going through the very same thing that you're trying, that you're going through right now. I don't understand it. I, I don't pretend to understand it. That's why this is such a hard message to preach. Thirdly, not only does our suffering help us, our suffering helps others, but our suffering glorifies God. I want to caution on this measure because I think a lot of people use this as kind of a catch basin for all suffering they can't explain. Well, quite frankly, I can't really explain any, any of it, let alone all of it. So, so let me just say this, that there's more, there's more to it than just these three points. Okay? The truth is, God can do whatever he wants with his creation. That's true. He can do whatever he wants with his creation. It's his. It doesn't make him cruel. It makes him the creator. He can do whatever he wants. If he wants to destroy something, he can destroy it because it's his. And that's a right that he has. And I'm just telling you, beloved, that when I build something, if I don't like it, I can destroy it. It doesn't make him cruel. It makes him the creator. It doesn't mean that he enjoys suffering it just means that he chooses to get the glory from the suffering. And again, these are, these are components like I just mentally can't get it together. He doesn't enjoy suffering. He just gets the return. 
He just gets what's left. He gets the glory from it. One of the most comprehensive passages on this is John chapter 9. I'm going to read you seven verses, so follow along with me. John 9, here we go. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin? Was it this man or his parents that he was born blind? See, already they're trying to blame. This is on him. This is chastening. Listen to what he says. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents. Ah. Now, does that mean that they're not sinners? No. Of course they're sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everyone's a sinner. Verse 3 is a response to verse 2. Who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? What Jesus said is neither. It's not their fault. But he goes on to say, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. He goes on to say, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he hath thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. I've been there, by the way. I did not rub mud in my eyes. Which is, by interpretation, sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Imagine the Son of God standing there, spitting on the ground, taking a little clay with the spittle, push it in your eyes and says, now go take care of that, That'll, that you'll be fine. If that's not rubbing spit in the wound. Now here's the reality, friends. Is that this guy who was born blind was not his fault. It was that the works of God should be made manifest. It wasn't, it wasn't him and it wasn't his parents. It was that God could demonstrate his power. Sometimes that's why we suffer. It was that God can demonstrate his power that way. This man's tragedy was a result of God's will in his life. Explain that one. I can't. Outside of the fact that God gets the glory for it, he's the creator, he can do what he wants with his creation, and now the return on the investment is that he came seeing. And later on, other people who read this story believed and placed their faith in him. So somehow or another, God used this man's blindness to produce fruit in his life and in other people's life. God got the glory. But it's not always God's fault. And so many times people blame God. Why do those who don't believe in God always blame him for tragedy? Why is that? Why do unbelievers blame a God they don't believe for suffering? They say, well, I don't even believe God, but it's his fault. Here's why. Because they don't understand it. Because they don't know the purpose of it. That's why they don't. That's why they blame. That's why even Christians tend to blame God, because I don't get it. One guy, he said this. He said, to live is to suffer. To survive is to find some meaning in that suffering. Let me give you an application. If you don't know what to say to somebody who's suffering, sometimes don't say anything at all. No matter how good you think your response is, sometimes it's just not good enough. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, just love the person, put your arm around them, and just be there for them. You don't have to have an answer. Now, if you're compelled to give them an answer, that's probably fine, but listen, sometimes you don't, we, we won't know. Sometimes we don't know. One writer, had, uh, one writer had distilled her pain and tragedy into an excellent book, The Bereaved Parent. She remembers that when her young son died during an operation to correct a congenital heart malfunction, her clergyman took her aside and said this, I know that this is a painful time for you, but I know that you will get through it all right because God never sends us more of a burden than we can bear. God only let this happen to you because he knows that you are strong enough
handled. Her thought was this. If only I was a weaker person, Robbie would still be alive. Friends, sometimes, no matter what we say to somebody in their time of suffering, it's just not good enough. And that's why the best thing we can do is just to love the person, to pray with them. I'm not saying don't say anything, but if God has given you something to say, then say it, but just use a tremendous amount of caution. Suffering is a very, very tough thing. It helps us, it helps others, and it glorifies God. You know, it's even it's interesting, even the, the, the suffering and the death of his son Jesus glorified himself. Go figure. Because he'll get the glory for anything. Because he's God. Because he's the creator. So mankind came into this world as a creation of God. Man fell. Sin entered into all of the uh, all of mankind because of Adam. And because of that, sin, death, and separation. 2,000 years ago, Christ comes on the scene. He lives a perfect life. And because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death and someone having had to die, Jesus came on and he suffered and died for us. I use this illustration. I want this hand right here to represent you and me, and I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says God loves us, hates our sin. The Bible says that this sin separates us from God. I want this hand to represent the Lord Jesus. This sin keeps us from getting to Christ. It keeps us. It's the, it's the prohibitor. This sin right here has to be paid for. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, though. So Jesus came 2,000 years ago to die on the cross for our sin. Wonderful. We needed someone else to make the payment because we couldn't make it. If we try to make it, we will spend an eternity separated from God forever. And the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's nothing you can do. It's nothing I can do. But the Bible says, For by grace we're saved through faith and not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. Jesus came 2,000 years ago to die on the cross to give us a gift. A wonderful gift of salvation simply by believing in him that he died, was buried, and rose again the third day, he looks at you and me as righteous as him. And we can know that we have eternal life forever because of what Jesus did on the cross, not because of what we've done. You know, what's interesting is he suffered for us. He suffered for us because we couldn't take that kind of suffering. Couldn't take it. We had to have somebody intercede on our behalf. If I was to ask anyone in this room, how many of y'all want to spend eternity in hell? Hopefully none of you will raise your hand. I'd like to be in heaven with the Lord. And I know by my faith in Jesus Christ alone that he died on the cross for my sin. I know I'm going to spend an eternity with him. And I, and I had eternal life. Something I can never lose. It's eternal. How can you lose something that's eternal? You can't lose eternal death separated from God in hell. Nobody would argue that point. Once you're in hell, you always go to hell. When you're in heaven, you're always in heaven. So when God says eternal, he means eternal, right? So Jesus died on the cross to give us eternal life so that we can't lose. The Bible says we're kept saved by the power of God unto salvation. It's wonderful. We're kept saved by his power. By his suffering and his death, we have eternal life. Friend, if you're going through something right now in your life, and if you're really struggling, if you're suffering, I, I don't know if I have words for you. Th this, this is in all of it. Th this is, this is, there's a whole lot more. There's passages and chapters in the Bible that deal with suffering and tragedy. And, and this is not a theological explanation. This is just basics. It helps you. It helps others. And God gets the glory. And I pray that somehow this has really touched you guys. Even as I study this, I, I look at this and I'm like, man, I can learn so much from this.